Welcome to our study this week of Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 11. My name is Scott Rainey. I serve with the Church of the Nazarene in the area of Sunday School and Discipleship Ministries International, or SDMI. This adult Sunday School video lesson is provided in collaboration between the Foundry Publishing, formerly Nazarene Publishing House, and SDMI. The Sunday School lesson is intended to support the local church's efforts to make disciples who make disciples. Please feel free to use this video in any way that helps your church or families. The popular saying, confession is good for the soul, is rarely put into practice in our world. Instead, it is a common human tendency to deny, justify, rationalize, or cover up wrongful actions. Seldom do people come forward voluntarily, confess their sin, and seek forgiveness and reconciliation of broken relationships. Consequently, many people opt for a life filled with fear, guilt, shame, and ultimately in captivity to the power of sin. There are people, however, who choose a different path. These rare but blessed people acknowledge their sins to God. They can testify to the liberating power of confession and the experience of forgiveness that leads them to joyful living. The book of Psalms contains 150 chapters. Only seven of them are referred to as penitential psalms or psalms that express a confession of sinfulness. Those psalms are Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. Today, as we continue walking in Christ through the season of Lent, we're going to look at one of those psalms, that is Psalm 32. We do not know what specific sin or sins King David is confessing in Psalm 32. We do know that he considered them first and foremost as sins against God himself. The title of Psalm 32 is A Maskell of David. The word maskell conveys the idea of instruction. The psalm opens with a pronouncement of blessing, much like what is found in the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. In Hebrew tradition, the blessed life was a life of shalom, that is, well-being, peace, wholeness, rightness with God and rightness with others. So our psalm begins with beatitudes that describe the person who lives in such peace. Psalm chapter 32. Of David, a mascal. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Uh, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and brittle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Of all the blessings God bestows upon his children, there is none better than forgiveness. The Hebrew word for forgiven carries the idea of lifting a burden. 
in all my life, I cannot count the number of times new converts express that when their sins were forgiven, they felt like the weight of the world had been lifted off their shoulders. Forgiveness suggests the image of a heavy load being taken by another person and carried away. The burden is not just relieved, it is transferred to another. In the case of sin, God takes the burden of sin upon himself. This picture of forgiveness is most dramatically accomplished in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, God's one and only son. Verses one and two give three parallel expressions that indicate that the blessed life of shalom is the outcome of forgiveness. The first one is, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, verse one. The Hebrew word translated transgressions here is pesha. This word means defiant rebellion against God. This is where a person knows what he or she is about to do is wrong, and he or she does it anyway. It is pure rebellion. And with the exception of Jesus Christ, every person on the planet throughout all creation has done this very thing. The second expression is, blessed is the one whose sins are covered, also in verse 1. The Hebrew word translated sins here is kataha. This represents the idea that sin is missing the mark or deviating from the standard for conduct. The image is that of a bow and arrow with a target. We have all fallen short and missed the mark of a bullseye. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says it this way, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. To say that our sins are covered is to imply that they are buried and forgotten. When God forgives, he forgets. He does not keep bringing up the offense. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The songwriter Nellie Edwards put words to song about how our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. Mine iniquities so vast, they've been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. The third expression is, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Verse two, the Hebrew word translated sin here is awan. This nuance of sin is the fact that sin is destructive behavior or a criminal act that shows no respect for God's law. This is an accounting term. God does not count our sins against us. There is no ledger with plus signs or minus signs on it. No scales with our sins on one side and our good deeds on the other side. We do not, indeed we cannot, balance the scales with enough good to offset the bad of sin. When God forgives, he counts us blameless. Interestingly, ancient Egyptian religious stories did not offer forgiveness to worshipers. Instead, they demanded payment for misdeeds. In the afterlife, Osiris weighs a person's good deeds and bad deeds on scales in order to determine reward or punishment. Not so with Israel's God, the one true God. All of transgressions, sins, and iniquities, as ugly as they are, God forgives when we humbly confess to him. The great news for us is that we can live in such a way that we have no deceit within us, according to verse 2. We can be totally honest with God, nothing hidden, nothing unconfessed. You don't have to live with anything hidden in a dark place. We can admit that we have been wrong. We can acknowledge our sin. I like to say that our relationship with God can be up to date, living ready, forgiven, no sin that would keep us away from a holy God. This is the blessed life of David that he speaks about in Psalm chapter 32. 
But King David remembers what it was like before, before his sins were forgiven. He describes this burden in Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. Sin has its effect on the person committing it. The Old Testament people of God understood that humans were sinful and prone to stray from God's ways. They understood that such sinfulness led to negative consequences, like sickness or defeat in battle because of God's justice. They had a healthy awareness that God is too righteous to tolerate sin, but also too merciful to remain deaf to the heartfelt plea of for, for forgiveness. The psalmist in Psalm 32, verse 3, describes the consequence of his decision to remain silent, not confessing his sin to God. Verse 3 describes his bones wasting away. This seems to imply an illness of some kind. Ancient Israel held a belief that sickness came from God's punishment of sin. We see this clearly in the book of Job, where Job's three friends tried to convince Job that he was obviously guilty of sin to have received such a horrible reversal of fortunes. Even the disciples of Jesus wrestled with this idea when they asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? John chapter 9, verse 2. We would certainly not say today that every illness an individual encounters is a direct result of that person's personal sin. At the same time, however, we know that people are made up of body, soul, and spirit, and these all affect one another. Our spiritual life does impact our physical well-being. The stress of living under the conviction of unconfessed sins weighs heavily upon the life, the physical life of a person. The concept of wasted away can also be seen as loss of spiritual vitality and the agony of living with guilt because of unconfessed sin. The bottom line is that unconfessed sin always finds a way to manifest itself in our lives. It is like a simmering pot ready to boil over. As King David remained silent, he experienced the constant reminder of his sinfulness. God's hand was heavy on him both day and night, verse 4. He lacked the possibility of a good night's sleep, the gift of a clear conscience. How would the psalmist revive his spiritual strength and vitality? According to Psalm 32, verse 5, he acknowledged his sin to God. He broke his silence. He took ownership of his sin. He openly admitted his sinfulness to God, who already knew what he had done. In the same way that verses 1 and 2 use three different words for sin, verse 5 uses those same three words, transgressions, sin, and iniquity. David dealt with sin in its totality. God's action was immediate and without condition. God forgave the guilt of the psalmist's sin, verse 5. A sincere and total confession of our sin to our Creator brings instant forgiveness by God's wonderful grace. David now turns his focus to all the faithful in Psalm 32, verses 6 through 11. Here is where the mascal, the instruction, begins. David begins to instruct the people of God to respond in a similar way, confession before God. The faithful are called to pray while he may be found, verse 6. Today, not tomorrow, is the opportune time to seek God through prayer and experience his presence. The words of advice from David are simple. Confess sin immediately. The danger of not doing this right away is that if sin settles in your life, the longer you wait, the harder it might be to the harder it might seem to find God. To make this clear, David uses a word picture of torrential floodwaters that would fill the dry riverbeds called wadis and overflow during a sudden storm in Israel. When such unexpected threats to life come, the faithful should seek God immediately. 
such trials and troubles will not overtake and destroy the life of the godly. God would keep them safe in his protective presence. King David had found God's faithfulness to be forever true. He calls God his hiding place in verse 7. The Hebrew word translated hiding place is the word for shelter. This word conveys the idea of God's protective presence that keeps his faithful people safe from dangerous situations. Psalm 27 verse 5 says this, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Not only will God hide his faithful one, he will surround them with songs of deliverance. Songs of deliverance is a reference to the battle cry of a victorious conqueror who delivers his people from the enemy forces. Take that in for a second. When we confess our sins to God, he forgives. He is our hiding place. And when we, when we are forgiven, there is a victory parade with others singing songs of deliverance around us. This sounds a lot like Jesus' words in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, where Jesus said, I tell you the truth, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven, victory parade, over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Some commentators put verses 8 and 9 as God's response to King David, who acknowledged God as his deliverer. This would be similar to the statement in Psalm 51, verse 13, where David said, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Other commentators suggest that the psalmist is instructing people who live in unconfessed sin on the appropriate action they should take in order to enjoy spiritual vitality in their lives. The question is, how are, we, how are we to stay on the path of life characterized by confession of sins and the experience of God's forgiveness? Here's a brief response to this question from our passage today. Avoid being stubborn like a horse that can only be controlled by bit and brittle. Listen closely to the Lord's voice. Learn to obey quickly and completely. Stay humble and responsive to the blessed voice of God. If you remain in him, God promises to surround you with his unfailing love, not because you've lived a perfect life, but because God's grace is at work in you. So sing praises to our God as a fitting response to such love. One songwriter sang praises this way, such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love, that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this.